I'm not holding your hand, it looks like we're hearing like, you know, Dr. Phil. Phil. I won my job, which is um, kind of awesome. It's kind of a weird way of getting your job, I guess, winning in a competition, but there was a V presenter search in 2009, and I was living in the UK at the time, and I'd always sort of wanted to be a part of music television or music media, and so I entered and um, kept entering while I was living overseas because it was most of it was online. And when I got to the top 30, I had that sort of difficult decision to make, you know, do I stay in London and do what I was doing or do I pack it up and go home and compete as a finalist? And I came home, I competed and I killed it. So. <laughs> My background's in performing arts, so I kind of always wanted a, a full-time job in TV and presenting because I was just, I was overdoing a hundred different things and I sent in my reel about two years ago and I didn't hear anything and I thought, oh no, I'm going to have to go to uni. And surely enough, they give, gave me a call and I auditioned and Billy actually did my screen test with me. Yeah. That was the first time we met. I was so nervous to, to meet him, but um, it was a breeze. We made it a breeze. He probably got me the job. I would say it would be, you know, at least, you know, 50%, only because we're obviously in front of camera all the time and you've just got to be, you've got to be on. And so the whole performing aspect and live stuff that we do do, all those, all that dance training and singing and performances that I did do really does help um, with that side of things. But obviously it's about knowledge and it's about music as well and you've got to, you've got to know your shit. you can't just, you know, fluff your way through. So I, I definitely say it was a, a big part and for me, Going to NIDA, um, I've trained performing arts and, and all that kind of thing really, really helps to, because you, you kind of, you're putting on a show at, at the end of the day, like. Sometimes. And, yeah. Yeah, I just feel like I, I become, it's like I look at it as a, a role, of, like an acting, a character of some sort. I'm still myself, but I know when I'm in front of camera, I kind of, I turn it on. I found myself in Bondi Junction living in a room with like a 55 year old French woman and an 80 year old woman whose son would come over and shower every night because their bathroom was getting renovated and his guy was like George Costanza man, like he's like some <laughs> middle aged dude, he was bringing over boxes of his new um, business plan was selling soft beef jerky, oh so he was giving me boxes of jerky to sell to people at work. Happens. So my first month in Sydney was interesting but we have an amazing team here and that's one of the things I'm really proud of and we'll tell everyone about, the team we have here aren't just workmates. I call them family. I have a Sydney family now and pretty much all of them work in this office. So they may not have given me a place to stay, stay so to speak, or a car, but you know, they gave me love. And a job. And a job and money. <laughs> money and love. I think if anything on a live show, it shows people that it's live, which is a good thing. Otherwise, if it's so perfect, it could have just been people filmed want yesterday. To see people stuff up. At so the end you own it. It's like, well, this isn't working. What a well oiled machine we have here. And you're like, hurry up. And we hurry just up, try and hurry stretch up. it out and, you know, talk crap or talk about something relevant until we get to the packing. It's really funny, though, because you could be really relaxed on the couch, we're talking. Then, as soon as the technical fault stretch, or whatever, you see everyone's sort of demeanor. Okay, heart <laughs> racing. Now we're getting tested, and it's just like everyone brings it, and it's exciting. Like yeah. afterwards when you rap, it's like, okay, it was really hairy there for a while. It was a bit messy, but we got through yeah. it and we as had to- As soon as you have to bring it at that, you know, to the brink, it's like everyone just all of a sudden like- On. Is on. Yeah, we're all happening. So we don't pick the music. Yeah. We, there's, there's times when we do. There's times when we'll have a bit of a property where we'll be able to play something we want. But most of the time we're given a playlist. Um, the same time we can influence a playlist, I very much will go up to the programming team and say, hey, I've found this, I've sourced this, I think this is really good, we can play this on the channel. But, but at the end of the day, yeah. At the end of the day, you don't. But if it's something you don't like, like, I have an issue and people tell me, like, I should just move on and it's done. But I hate playing Chris Brown, I think the guy's a jerk. I think move on, it's done. Regardless of his songs, I don't care. I think, why are we endorsing this terrible human being? And so I'll just say that. Playing his song may mean we're playing it, but I'm not going to endorse it, and I can use that as a vehicle to say what I want about him. Oh, From a personal point of view, I'm sort of lucky in that I've always loved, I've always loved pop music as well as stuff that's a bit more alternative and stuff from all over the place. So sort of have my finger in a lot of pies anyway, but you do definitely have to yeah. cast a wide net and make sure you're not just well, I guess ignoring your audience and what they want in favour of stuff that you find interesting. Because I know I'm a bit stubborn sometimes with certain genres, where, whether it be rock or dubstep, that I'm probably not, you know, the most fond of. And I get really passionate about the fact that I don't really like it. So 
sometimes I just have to let it go yeah. and learn to just embrace it and see the good, you know, what other people like about it and, you know, see the good parts of the genres of music I might not necessarily love to start with. But we're lucky in that we have four distinct personalities with four very different tastes in music. Mm -hmm. So what Carissa doesn't like, someone else probably will like. And on the couch or in any shows we have, we now have a, a voice for and against, which creates more of a, a, a better dialogue than just someone, I love everything. Yeah. And, it's, it's good to have that a, a bit of contrast and a bit of grey in there. So, yeah. I mean, it's cool to, to own what you like, yeah. but also own what you don't like and, and be the, the devil's advocate when you have to be. Popular music for a reason. Yeah. And I'm the popular music queen. So I don't really understand why people would hate on it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. If anything, it's the obscure alternative music that I would think, you know, people would hate on because it's not commercial and, you know, out, out there and well known. No. Yeah, I, because I was always like, one thing that you get a lot is, oh, yeah, you guys play some really terrible music sometimes, or the music you're playing, it's it. so poppy, and so, and it's like, yeah, like, I don't necessarily dig it all, but I've gotten to a point where I'm now comfortable defending it. I had someone come up to me at Laneway Festival on the weekend, saying, man, that, I'm so sick of seeing this, like, bloody Rihanna country and all that sort of stuff. I'm like, cool, don't watch that, there's other yeah. stuff there for you, because this, this stuff has a place, and I think commercial music, for a lot of people, is the first door or the window opening to a love of music. I started there, I was a top 40 kid, I was obsessed with pop music. Mm. And then from there, when you go up a lot of times, well a lot of, well, a lot of people, obviously not so much in your case, but um, it, they can stay there, or it, it becomes a springboard sometimes and then you'll discover other bands. And I think if you have a love of music, no matter what that music is, yeah. we might not see eye to eye in the same band, we but the fact, yeah, the fact you love it means we're talking the same language yeah. and we'll just eventually, we'll eventually get there. So I will defend pop music, I, I love pop music. Well, we both love Kanye. We both love and that, Kanye. That's right now. He's like my number one. But I'm like the hip hop, R and B, pop girl, I guess you could say, out of the group. So generally, you know, I stick to the Jay Z and the Rihannas, and I like a lot of jazz and soul kind of music as well. Etta James and Chaka Khan. Um, so yeah, I guess that's the genre I would say I love the most would be the the rhythm and blues of music. Yeah. Um, you love a bit of everything. I do love a bit of everything. Um, actually, my neighbour commented to me the other day, I hear you playing that Rihanna song a lot, because every time I get in the shower, I play Rihanna and Drake. <laughs> um, take care. Yeah, no, not just take care, but um, what's my name? Oh, okay, um, that's yeah. a bit embarrassing. But no, um, I'll do a complete 180. Some of my favourite stuff, like older stuff that my dad raised me on. Like I used to listen to stuff like The Clash, Velvet Underground, all that sort of stuff, and really love like guitar-heavy bands, even bands from the 90s like Pavement, Slater Kinney. And I really love um, stuff from Melbourne, the Melbourne sort of um, garage, rocky sort of stuff, championed by like Eddie Current, Dick Diver, um, and all that kind of dirty Melbourne goodness. And Rihanna. <laughs> and Britney. And Britney and Rihanna. And, and Gaga. Gaga. <laughs> Mine's all personal, and because of that, music comes into it because I love music, whether I had this job or not. I hate using it for a spam sort of thing. I hate being told, oh, you should tweet about watching this show. And I, cause I don't think that's what it's for. Mm -hmm. I think something like Twitter or, and other social networks are a way of just showing your personality to building up your persona. Um, and I think talking about your everyday and that and sharing more about your life and interacting with people makes you more endearing and it makes you a human. If they're able to interact with us, I think that's just on another level, like personally, they, they would feel like they, they know us. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Like I know on the other side, if you know a presenter or someone I looked up to, you know, had spoken to me, I'd be like, wow, that's really cool. And I would dig them a lot more and respect their opinion a lot more. You know, I'd want to tune into WTF and get involved and share my opinion. And for me, it also goes like, it's a two way street. Like we can talk about music all we want on air, but you're effectively saying it to no one. There's a, there's a cameraman, producer, and a camera in the room. You're not talking to anyone. Whereas to take those same conversations, hey, this new video, hey, this happened, and have someone talk back to you, there's instant gratification, and I like talking mm. to people. It's so hard to watch yourself back sometimes. Especially if you so know you. It's critical on, you know, everything that you say and do, and oh, it's just... It's hard. Cringeworthy at times. We watch our live show back. We have oh. a live show on the weekend called The Riff and we watch it back on a Tuesday morning when we all eventually um, take you know some time to come and do some work. And I, if you know there's a moment coming up from the live show where you've sort of stuffed up, like just accidentally start talking over the top during the meeting to try and distract away from Maybe it. Maybe I do this thing where we will cough. Oh, uh, 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 what? Uh, uh, has it finished thing. yet? I yeah. talk on the like the time I know I've said something stupid. I'm like, oh yeah, guys. Anyway, oh that was so dumb. Like yeah. they can't hear it. Well, I'm 
honestly, we get to meet you know our favorite bands and, and talk to them and find out you know cool, interesting information that we want to ask because we come up with the questions. So that's that's probably the coolest thing. About yeah, the, the the access to those artists and that sort of stuff because at the end of the day, you do this job because you're a music fan. Mm. You're a fan first and foremost. Like presenters, what it says on your email title and on business cards and that sort of stuff. But you're a fan, so. You have someone you, whose face you have on your bedroom wall as a kid growing up and they're sitting next to you. Actually, that's probably a worse moment. That's really scary. But it's the fact you get to do that and you get paid to do it, it's... Um, we have to hit ourselves sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's pretty cool. If someone came to me and said, I want to be on TV, I'd probably tell them, you've already said the wrong thing. It sounds like you're doing it for the wrong reason. It shouldn't be about, hey, I just want to get my big face on TV. It should be, hey, I love music, how can I make music my job? Because I think if with a love of music and a passion about it, that's where your grounding should be because the rest should follow. I never grew up saying, I want to be on television. I'd always love TV, but music was my thing. And I think a music fan does the best job at presenting music. I made sure I knew my audience, I knew my potential employers, and I did it for the right reasons. And you can make it happen. Yeah, and just as Billy said, you, you have to get up off your ass and work your butt off. You cannot sit around and just wait for it to happen, as they say. You really, you really do have to work hard at it. I took the time to learn about the place I was applying for, which was a given, and it's not just a given like for this job, it's for all jobs. You should mm. know about your employer. Yeah. Because we had the big bosses and we didn't know this. They were sitting behind a screen watching everything. They were watching us in a room as contestants talking. They saw everything, not just when we were on camera. Because how you are on camera is one thing, but you're hiring a person, you want to know what the person's like. So when we have some of the pre-existing hosts come and talk to us as contestants and applicants, just talking to us about the channel. We didn't know we were being listened, but they were there to grill us. And they were saying, who knows stuff about the channel? If you had to read the bios on the website, you can tell me who's my favorite artist, um, who kissed Robbie Williams in an interview, who did this. And I was the only person who could go bam, 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 bam. And straight away, you make yourself stand out. After I won my job, I got really drunk and there was a video camera lying around at home. And so I like made this video that I wanted to watch. If I ever felt jaded, if I ever looked down the path, like I might have been down the path and been really depressed or whatever, to know how happy I was at that point in time that I just won this job. And yeah. watching this video, this is this drunk me going, my dreams just come true. <laughs> and it has, and it can Hey, mine's happen. worse. My mum bought me like this plaque, you know, it says dream, and then it's got a little spiel. And she's like, read that every night and your dreams, and I did for a while there. And look, right. Look. Joke. Yeah, yeah dreams. That's awesome. Coming true. <laughs>